Hello and welcome. I am your host, JP Jump Hush from the Two Man Power Trip. And of course, joining me is the greatest booker, one of the greatest bookers and minds ever in the history of the business, the games master, the taskmaster, the devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing excellent. How about you, my man? Not too bad. Can't complain. Can't complain at all. Um, what do you think? Just I know we were talking about this last week too, but what do you think about maybe Rock? Um, I don't know, not usurping, but kind of going above Roman here as like the top heel. Is that a problem or is that not true? Or what do you think about that? How how could it not happen? Oh, how could it not happen? True, he's he's the Rock. Yeah, the one of the greatest of all time. Is that a thing you have to do for booking to kind of prevent that? Well, no. How, how could – nothing could prevent it. The Rock is the most recognizable person on the planet right now, I think. But it feels like even when he's a heel, he's the, the top dog. You know what I mean? He, he kind of uh, makes he everybody really... else look lesser than. <laughs> uh, let's go back to Hulk Hogan. Steve Austin. When you're the top guy, you're the top guy, but no one's ever done what The Rock has done in the history of pro wrestling. I mean, he's on, he's mainstream, not just wrestling, movies on television shows, owns a football friend, uh, league. How could he not? And people don't actually boo him. They're booing him as that character, but they're cheering for him also, right? Yeah, definitely. It definitely seems that way. Yeah, so how could anybody overcome what he got? I mean, he is the man. There's no question about it. Do you think that he does make Roman like look like... Lesser than, like, does it make Roman look like he? It should be Rock versus Cody instead. Is that what it's kind of looking like to you, or no? Well, I think that match is going to happen after Roman somewhere down the line. They've built this thing. If people knock it because of that, they're out of their minds. The they drew the most money they have had last Raw since two thousand nineteen. Yeah. Biggest, biggest crowd in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, biggest crowd in Chicago in like 10 years. Yep. Yeah, biggest crowd they've ever had since 2019 for a Raw. Yep. How can you not think that it's go they're going to do a magnificent two days and then they have that Rock versus Cody in their back pocket if the Rock doesn't turn babyface? That's the problem they might yep. have is if The Rock turns babyface in that match. If Roman and people, you know, and you're saying that Roman is overshadowed by The Rock, right? How yep. do you think Cody will do? Right. I feel like Roman's above Cody, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's a great... With all the ratings and the houses and the biggest show since 2019 i sometimes think wrestling fans overlook things this is probably the best the business has ever been even Would more so than so attitude no? even more so than That's, hogan error or attitude error absolutely there's much more to do and look at what they were up against uh what's her name caitlin the basketball player Oh, from Iowa, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, she, they had the biggest uh, audience of all times for women basketball. I mean, there's so much more to do, so many more streaming stations. Uh, when Hogan was doing it, there was a few, there was no streaming stations. I mean, they, they're doing by far exceeding the competition compared to not taking anything away from the attitude there is one of the greatest of all times, but they didn't have the competition that they're going against. 
Now, as far as WrestleMania, obviously that's big. Do you think The Rock, with this rumor that he won't be back until August, do you think that's true? Or do you think maybe he could film vignettes and still show up once in a while in between filming? Because I guess he's filming between April and August. Do you think he could still be part of SummerSlam? Uh, I'm sure he could be part of it, but I would think he's smart enough not to overexpose himself. So as far as today and, and the topic at hand, wanted yeah. to talk about Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig. And obviously you have a bit of history with him, but just going all the way back, I know you obviously WWE worked together, but going all the way back, do you remember the first time you met Kurt? I met him in, in uh, Baltimore when he first came in. Other than that, I didn't have never met him, but we had mutual friends. Did you know Larry the Axe Henning at all? Yeah, I met him one time. He came to Florida for a shot. So yeah. what did you, th what did you think of what did you think of Henning when you kind of first laid eyes on him and you first saw him? Oh, I thought he's fabulous. Fabulous. I mean, a great performer, great uh bum taker. I mean, I think he uh, emulated Ray Stevens with the bumps because Ray was up in Minnesota for a long time. When you look at Larry versus him, though, right? I mean, much different as far as wrestling looks, just a lot different than his dad. Right, right. But go think... back to what? Go ahead. I was going to say, do you think that's good, though, in some cases? So it's not like he's like a clone or going to be the same guy as, as his dad as far as wrestling. Let's go back to Blackjack Mulligan and Barry Windham. Completely different back yep. in the day. So, yeah, I think it separated him following in his dad's footsteps and shadow. Just like Barry. The crazy thing is, okay, he's he's basically lifelong childhood friends with Rick Rude who got into the business. And obviously his dad is the one that got him into the business. But that Robbinsdale, Minnesota area is crazy, right? I mean, it's like you can't not become a pro wrestler if you're from that area. It's crazy. Well, it's like the Tampa area. You know, Kern, Mike, Paul Orndorff, Hulk Hogan, uh, David Sierra. Uh, Brian Blair, Joe Gomez. I mean, there's hundreds just like Robinsdale. So you had Hennig, Rude, I think uh, Brady Boone, Nikita Koloff, John Nord, Scott Norton, Barry Darso, Tommy Zink, Road Warrior Hawk, and I think Animal from somewhere not too far away from the area. But I mean, it's it's a ton of guys in that area right. of Robinsdale's nuts. Right. Right. Do you think if the if your dad's a wrestler, like he's got to be a wrestler, meaning that Hennig was like destined to be a wrestler and destined to be in the business? No, I don't think. I don't think the majority of wrestlers' father was in the business. It's more prevalent now than it's ever been. But uh, back in the day, it was very rare to see a father and son. I mean, I mean, the Guerreros were different. But when I was in Florida, there was Mike Graham and there was Barry Windham. I don't remember in Kendall Windham and I don't remember anybody else's father. Uh, Vern, it seemed to me that the sons came in when the fathers became promoters. Greg Gagne, Vern Gagne. Well, the Funks, obviously, you know, yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. So looking at Kurt, obviously he's a completely different athlete. His dad was like big, burly, muscular, just kind of more of like a mountain man kind of guy. And Kurt was athletic as hell, a bit skinnier back then, of course, but just he right. just could move like no other. He had um, an athleticism that definitely – kind of overtook his dad's in my view like just looking at them it's like wow man he he moves like a cat and he's right. six four but he moves like a cat i don't think he's six four no you don't think he was that tall 
No, no, no. How tall do you think he was? Six three. Six, oh, six oh, okay. Yeah, he always seemed a bit taller to me. So, no, no. But he was a great athlete, without question. Yeah. Starts off in AWA, obviously, because that's where his dad was was a star and kind of, you know, bringing him into the business. Do you think nepotism could work against you in the business? I know we've talked about that before with, like, um, maybe Greg Gagne or a few different guys, but do you think nepotism can work against you in the business? Well, it gives you a start, uh, a leg up on a start, but you have to have talent. You know what I mean? There's been plenty of guys that were sons that tried to follow their father's footsteps that didn't make it. When you look at Hennig, he does actually go, and maybe people have forgotten or maybe people didn't realize, he does go to WWF basically between 81 and 83, kind of on and off, and he's not really used right. I mean, they'll, they'll bring him in as – you know, maybe getting wins over Johnny Rodgers, something like that, but he's basically used as an enhancement guy, so to speak, because he's losing to Greg Valentine and Killer Khan and, and different guys like that. Do you think that's a good idea to head up to, to the North in WWF, which is you know, possibly the biggest territory, and go there and do jobs? Do you get the experience, or do you think that can work against you? I don't think it hurt him at all. I think it is how they're worked into a program after they've been involved in these so-called enhancement matches and then doing jobs. I don't think it's going to hurt him to do a job for Killer Khan or Greg Valentine, who are wrestling the champs and, you know, Khan, the giant, broke the giant's leg. So he's losing the very, very high guys on the card. One of those things where they're bringing him in, but they have no purpose for him. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's is it just to get reps you go there for? Is it just to get noticed? No, is it get the experience? It's to get into the magazines. It's get to be uh, let the people see him. That he's young. He's athletic. The magazines are going to give him a push because they've been told to give him a push. Yeah, and then he goes to Portland and learns his craft. Exactly. He goes to the Pacific Northwest over with uh, Don Owen in Portland and really kind of honed his skills. His dad, obviously, goes over there with him as well. They actually do win the PNW Tag Team titles together over there, which is pretty cool to, to do that and obviously win a title and wrestle with your dad. What was it about the Pacific Northwest that can get you kind of ready or get you in gear or get you more tuned up and get you a good experience? Piper was there. Snooker was there. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, what was Paul, the heavy set guy, the blonde? He did the one arm push ups. Buddy, 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 what? buddy Rose, Playboy yeah, Buddy, buddy Rose. Rose. Yeah, it was, wasn't he Paul Pershman at one time? I forget, but anyway, yeah. they brought they brought in Morocco. I mean, King Curtis was there, they just was, uh, very, very easy territory to work. The trips were short, and you made pretty good money. Paul Persman, that by the way, is his real name, <laughs> so that's probably yeah. why you know him as yeah. Paul Persman. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of those things with PNW, though, which stinks, it's what happened to that library, that tape library. I feel like it's not really out there, it's been like deleted or they taped over, or what happened to the tape library out there. I think they taped over it. Supposedly, Buddy Rhodes had a copy of every show. From yeah, that's how a lot of people had, like, taped or had some stuff was from him. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy the, what it would be worth now just because, hey, you get to see Piper. Hey, you get to see Hennig. You know what I mean? You get to see all these right. guys. Right. So... Hennig is pretty much, you know, learning his craft, but he is wrestling, like you said, in PSW. He is going to Memphis a little bit. He is going to Central States. He is going to New Japan Pro Wrestling. So he's learning his craft. He's getting better. When he comes back, basically, I guess you could say 83-ish, and he heads back to AWA, 
he's still doing all the other uh, territories and stuff. But I mean, he's really starting to make his own. And then as you start getting further into the 80s and go into 1987, I feel like he really kind of breaks out. He becomes the AWA world champion at Super Clash 2. He defeated Nick Bockwinkel. Do you think, I know obviously there's still a lot of controversy with that match and, and, and what happened there, but as far as him and being put on the map and being champion for you know well over a year for the AWA. Do you think that's how he really, you know, got his name from being the AWA champion for a while? No, no. The AWA was slumping at the time badly. I think he got his name because he was such a great worker. He had great matches every night, no matter where he went. You know, do you back think- in the- go ahead. Do you think that counts as a world championship in the 80s, the AWA? You know, some people say, oh, it doesn't count as a world title. Does that count as the world title? It counts as the most prestigious title you can have in that territory. I mean, yeah, it was uh, recognized as a world title by a lot, lot of states. So, yeah, I guess it was. With him winning, obviously he's he's a babyface going into the match. He defeats Bockwinkle, kind of with with some uh, with some help from Zabisco and some heel work there, and turns villain, you know, or turns heel, excuse me, you know, in the match and kind of just turns there, and then basically holds the title for over a year. I feel like that really helps him, and obviously he gets a lot of experience. And he would feud with you know, Greg and Vergania and different things like that. And Bockwinkle, do you think that? That's where he get on Vince's radar, though, and not necessarily. Oh, he's making a big name for himself. He's feuding with this guy, but is that kind of where you get on Vince's radar? It's like, okay, this guy's the champion of that company. I'm going to keep my no, eye on this guy. No, he was. Uh, he was such a great worker, and they liked him when he was coming to New York. And then out of New York, they wouldn't have him back. As you were saying earlier, he'd come in, then leave, come in. They wouldn't have done that if they didn't have plans for him for later. Did it help that he won the title? It certainly didn't hurt. I always felt like with AWA, though Vince definitely had his eyes on some of those guys. Obviously, Hogan, mean, although he obviously he was in WWF before, but Hogan, Mean Gene, Bobby Heenan, The Rockers, you know what I mean? A lot of guys Dr. did Death. come from AWA. Not Dr. Death, Dr. Schultz, David Schultz. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I he did. definitely was keeping an eye on AWA. He tried to buy AWA at 1.2 and Vern turned him down. Right. Right. And that's when Vince said he didn't negotiate when he got in the car and left. So, yep. Yeah. When he's in AWA, also just interesting to note there was a diamond exchange. And this is obviously Diamond right. Dallas Page when he managed uh, Medusa and, and Bad Company. And uh, Kurt Hennig joins up with, with the diamond exchange. Kind of your first uh, foray into DDP there, you know, really becoming something in the AWA. Right. Right. So he has a lot of connection to a lot of guys, even kind of before he became Diamond Dallas Page as we know him obviously with Scott Hall at one point with Kurt Hennig. So it's always interesting to kind of go back and look and be like, wow, DDP is, you know, he's been in the business for a while. Even if he was a manager back in the eighties, he, he's got a lot of ties to the big names. Right. Right. So he loses the title to Jerry, the King Lawler on May 8th, 1988, kind of a, I guess you could say AWA house show, if you will, but it's really more of a CWA Memphis show because it's in Memphis, Tennessee. When that happens, obviously, he's he wants to kind of move on. He wants to head over to WWF. He loses the title to Lawler. Do you remember Lawler versus Perfect at all? Do you remember that match? Do you remember ever, ever seeing yeah. or ever hearing anything about it? Oh well, yeah, I, I I I've seen it on YouTube. Yeah. Do you think Do you think that that's basically kind of like okay? AWA is, is dying out here. We we have to team up, obviously, with a little bit of world class, with Memphis. Do you think that was kind of perfect leaving, meaning, like, is that like the death knell to AWA or no? No. Uh, first of all, Jerry Jarrett tried to get the NWO, NWA board to make Lawler champion. This is going to shock you. You know, one of the first reasons why they didn't do it no his outfit really why what's wrong with this outfit well think about it name me one ch- champion 
that wrestled in long tights in a singlet. Oh, they were going that specific. Wow, interesting. Yeah, true. Well, I'll give you an example. You know why when it came to uh, Terry against uh, Holly, when the vote came, it was very close? Yep. Do you know why it went to Terry? No. Terry was a college graduate, and he didn't have a tattoo. Think about that. Man, they were wacky back then. Yeah, that no, is weird. No, they weren't yeah. wacky. They weren't wacky. You see, like you said that. Now, people don't understand. The generation in the 60s, if you had a tattoo, you were either a sailor or kind of run afoul of the law. Do you see what I'm now, saying? Yeah. It's a whole so now- different generation. It's like people say, well, uh, how did they get away with the uh, racist language and is is in jokes? Come back, go back and watch uh, shows from the 70s. They were saying homophobic jokes, racial jokes. It's for the era that you're born or raised that we've taken a major jump that, you know, we, you can't offend anybody. Oh yeah. Right. So I mean, yeah. Can you imagine no tattoos? That would be a big deal for everybody's got a tattoo now. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. So what was the other reason they didn't want Lola to be champion? Well, that was the main reason that it ever got past that. Wow, they respect okay. Jer- Jerry as a performer. Yeah, and obviously he's a good draw. And might have been going way back and then up to Lala. The only guy that was not a shooter or a hooker or a semi-shooter was... Buddy Rogers, but Buddy Rogers was an amateur wrestling champion also. Yep. So I don't think Jerry had that background. It's so interesting, though, with with Lawler, because he obviously he's going to be, you know, Hennig here is going to be AWA champion. Then they kind of leave. The, the Memphis breaks away from the AWA. Then Zabisco becomes champion. And then obviously Mr. Saito and then Zabisco again. And then there's no more AWA. But it was almost like Hennig left at the perfect time because AWA definitely was dying off at that point. They were desperately trying to stay alive. And when he goes to the WWF and he signs up with Vince, they give him an awesome gimmick. He's Mr. Perfect, right? I mean, just a perfect timing of, of going there in 1988. Yeah, and he was a smart guy. It's the second generation. He saw the writing on the wall for the AWA. Do you love the Mr. Perfect gimmick? The undefeated yes. streak? He, he does everything perfect. Does that fit him very well? Because it just seems like that, man, this is a great gimmick for him. Absolutely. He was a great athlete. Do you consider it one of the greatest gimmicks of all time? Probably. For that era, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the theme see, song, goes, the towel, the gum, you know, everything. Yeah. It goes back to a different era. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The, the interviews now are very, very like The Rock and Punk and, and that interview that they did with the three of them. Years ago, there would have been a three-way pull apart, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Now they're just talking. It's very yep. UFC-ish. They're going to we're we're into a complete change of the business right now. Yeah, absolutely. Now with Perfect, he becomes uh, when he's not when he first starts cartoning, but he becomes Mister Perfect. He then adds in the singlet, like I said, he adds in the towel and the gum slap and. Just and the name and, and the theme song is awesome. But the greatest thing about that is I think the vignettes. Remember he bowled the oh, perfect three hundred. Yeah, yeah. The bowling and the basketball. 
golf. They were great. But here's something. I don't think Kirk should have ever had a single. It didn't show his body as well as he was built like a Greek god. I didn't yeah, like that. Yeah, I know you ever. mentioned that before. You don't, you, didn't, you don't like this singler. No, not on him. It didn't show his chest, his abs. He was in great shape. And you think that hurt him, though, as far as he could have went further with the regular tights, or does, not, does that not matter? I think the perception, if I saw it that way, maybe other wrestling fans saw it that way. Go back to this. Did Hogan uh, have did Hogan have uh, a singlet? No. Did Randy? No. I mean, it didn't come along. Uh, Heartbreak Kid, Austin, Rock. No. It didn't come along until Kevin Nash. Right. Yeah, and he had the pants with it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So he he bowls three hundred. He yeah. plays NBA basketball, which is awesome. He plays hockey with uh, Mike Modano. The basketball was with Felton Spencer. He does that awesome thing at football, which every fantasy football league or every season always starts off with people posting, "Hey, fantasy football!" Like you know, him passing the ball to himself and Steve right. Jordan going, "That was perfect," which is awesome. Wade Boggs and baseball is saying, "Wow, that was perfect." They just yeah. did such a great mashup of real sports and real athletes and these really famous guys, icons, yeah. really, and then some of them, and then him being able to do that sport just like that. It was perfect. It was great back then. Yeah, and Henning used to fish with uh, Wade Boggs. I actually fished with Kirby Puckett while he was fishing with Wade Boggs on the charity thing in the Keys. I fished with Kirby Puckett twice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Boggs seems like he was a big fan, too. I know he was good friends with Kurt, but he seems like a big wrestling fan. Well, he grew up in Tampa. How could he not be? And he was, a, for some reason, there was a great picture of him backstage at WCW. All the members of the flock in gimmick and a Tim with them. <laughs> it yeah. was Raven and the flock. Just so funny. It's like, wow, he, he really is a fan. He, you know, obviously, he went to the show to see Kurt, but man, he really is a fan. Oh, he was a huge fan. Yeah. Do you think, though, when this Mr. Perfect gimmick is coming, like, Basically, he's Mr. Perfect. He doesn't lose. That's the thing. Like, he'll win Survivor Series. You know, he'll win at SummerSlam. He'll beat you know, Ronnie Garvin and the Blue Blazer, Red Rooster. He'll beat Blue Blazer at WrestleMania 5. Do you think that it could work against you, though? Because if you're Mr. Perfect, you can't lose. Is there a possibility that that can work against you? Yes. How so? Well, if you... Okay. You know how I always weep uh, sister sport boxing into wrestling, right? Yep. Ali, did he go undefeated? Nope. Tyson? Nope. Holyfield? Nope, no. none of them. None of them. Just Mayfield, uh, Mayweather. Yeah. And he wasn't a heavyweight. No, no. He the only one that went undefeated because he got out was Rocky. And he had some questionable decisions against Roland Lestanza and somebody else I can't remember. And, uh, you know, he, he knew that his days were numbered. He wanted to retire undefeated. And Mayweather, some of them are a little controversial too, like De La Hoya yeah. fight. He probably lost. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of them he probably lost. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to Ali, I mean, Norton could have won the three fights. They were that close. You remember? Oh, yeah. Yep. Definitely. Even I think the last one, I think he lost, really. But I mean, yeah. Yeah. It was a split decision on the two we won. So you think that sometimes, Mister Perfect, you gotta you gotta lose this undefeated streak. You know, it's gonna have to come to an end, basically. Yeah, yeah, it, it should have happened with somebody 
that was out of the blue, so he could bitch about it. Right. He could have made a big deal out of that, like a one, two, three kid, like Hall did. Yep. The thing is with Mr. Perfect, he's awesome, right? He's beating all these guys, doing all those things. It seems like everything, especially because at the Royal Rumble 1990, him and Hogan are the last two guys, and Hogan throws him out. So it seems like almost destined to be Hogan perfect. Have you heard this? Or have you seen this rumor where it seemed like that was almost possibly going to be the WrestleMania six main event or possibly be a big show main event between those two? Absolutely. I mean, they didn't come up with that finish without them thinking that's where they were going. Why didn't it happen? What's the, the story? I have no idea. Uh, Maybe Hulk wasn't sure about Kurt. I don't know. I don't know what their background was in AWA. Do you think that he was thinking, oh, he's a little bit smaller? Even though he's not small compared to Hulk, no. like he's a little bit smaller. Is it believable that I'm going to lose to this guy? Because you know Hulk, how he could be. Yeah, it could have been that. Because Hulk was fighting monsters at the time. It could have been that he didn't want to vary from what was working. And I asked J.J. Dillon about this, too, because I was like, oh, it seemed like, you know, at the time you guys were kind of, obviously he worked behind the scenes. So it seemed like you guys were kind of going in that direction. He was saying they kind of used some of the house shows that they worked together as like a barometer. And maybe it didn't, they sold well, but they didn't sell oh. like crazy where people were clamoring to see it. So they were like, okay, maybe Perfect isn't the the main event guy for WrestleMania against Hogan, you know, this coming year, 1990. Right. That was, well, if it came from JJ, I think it was a pretty good source telling you the truth. Now, he's undefeated, right? But he does lose an MSG to the Warrior on March 19th, 1990. He does, at WrestleMania six, shockingly lose to Brutus Beefcake. That's his, like, first official loss. Is, is that crazy or what? Yes. What was going on here? I think that was a Hulk influence, don't you? Seems like it, but it just seems like, wow, he's undefeated. Basically, the genius beat Hogan via countdown on Saturday night's main event before that with Perfect's help, and then they destroy Hogan's belt. You know what I mean? They destroy it. They just break right. apart the world title. So it, so it's like, wow, Perfect's getting this great push, and then it leads to him versus Beefcake? Like, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, strange. Absolutely. And that's Beefcake what, getting a win. That's why this bloodline is so good. Everything makes sense. Yeah, be, 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 beating him. Yeah, beating him for the undefeated streak is like what? Yeah, yeah. nuts. Yeah, I know we we both love beefcake, but I mean, come on here. This is this is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um. So basically, he beats him WrestleMania six. Then Saturday night's main event. Hogan then finally, uh, April 28th, finally wrestles perfect and he beats him. But obviously Hogan had already lost the title to Warrior, but that kind of nips the Hogan perfect thing in the butt. Hogan finally beats him on TV. So it's right. one of those things, it's weird. It's almost like backwards. Perfect should have beat Beefcake at WrestleMania and then Hogan can beat him. Yeah. And give him, give him his first loss. Right. They didn't see it that way. I mean, and that was a, probably what JJ was saying. The barometer was those house shows that they didn't sell out. Or it yeah, wasn't getting the, enough attention. And the people at that time were educated for Hogan and Russell Monsters. So they decide to do something different and, and go a different way. And it's Hogan versus Warrior WrestleMania 6, title for title, you know, big baby face versus big baby baby face. The worlds are colliding there. So they definitely made it into a gigantic main event, but just with that perfect involved. So interesting. I wonder if do you think he had any heat there losing the beefcake. <laughs> That's got to like kind of run through your mind a little bit too. Like, what's going on losing a beefcake here? No, I don't think so. I think that was nepotism. 
he then wins a tournament because Warrior wins the title. His IC title gets vacated because these both champs can't be both champs. So right. instead of losing it or whatever, they just vacated. He beats Tito Santana in the finals of the tournament, and he becomes Intercontinental Champion. So he's not getting deep pushed by any stretch of imagination. This is back when the Intercontinental title meant a lot, right? I mean, it was an important title back in 1990. Very important. Very important. And they usually give it to the best worker. Absolutely. Right? The worker's title. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. yeah. The work office title. Now, Beefcake obviously will not be wrestling at SummerSlam due to that uh, horrific yeah, accident yeah. with the parasailing. So Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich, is now in the WWF, and he starts feuding with Mr. Perfect. He actually beats Perfect in a great match, wins the title at SummerSlam. And then, of course, Mr. Perfect has to win the Intercontinental Championship back. So he's a two-time Intercontinental Champion. But, man, that's that interesting. So could they have had Beefcake beat him again at SummerSlam, too? It seemed like they were going that way if T Tornado beat uh, Mr. Perfect at SummerSlam. Seemed like oddly going that direction. Might have, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Crazy. Uh, yeah. Tex Tornado and Perfect were, were great. Great feud. Perfect always had great matches, and especially in WBF. Like, randomly on, on MSG, he'll fight Piper and have one of Piper's best matches. I mean, he could wrestle with anybody and just really be, like, perfect, like he, the name says. He was a great technician. Great performer. Great match at WrestleMania 7. Kind of uh, under the radar match against Big Boss Man. He he then you know has, has a bunch of different feuds, but let's fast forward to SummerSlam 91. Mm -hmm. Instant classic. He's got supposed to be a tailbone issue, bulging disc. In his back. He's got all these issues, and he, him and Bret Hart at MSG, SummerSlam 91, give one of the most memorable matches in SummerSlam history. One of the best matches in WWF history. Just unbelievable match. Right, right. Well, there are two great technicians in the ring at the same time. Kind of worry though with injuries and stuff, right? I mean, what are they doing to be able to wrestle, even though he has a tailbone issue and, and bulging disc? It's like, what are they taking? What are they doing to be able to wrestle and kind of grit through the pain? Well, he's from the old school. You have to work through injuries. Whatever you took to get to the ring, you took. He, of course, then during or what well, really after the injury becomes Ric Flair's executive assistant or his executive consultant, the Mr. Perfect. So it was one of those things where he would still be on TV, still play a role as a heel, but he'd be aligned with, with Flair here as his executive consultant. Right. Right. So they do a lot of different things with him, teasing that he may be involved with the Macho Man Liz storyline, the Ultimate Warrior storyline, obviously all surrounding Savage versus Flair for the for the most part. Then he turns babyface and then starts feuding with Flair. So Summer or Survivor Series 92, after being with Flair, it's him and Macho against Razor Ramon and Ric Flair in, in a great tag team match. So he was definitely one of those guys where he could fill in in a spot if necessary. He could wrestle injured, but he could also play a baby face and a heel. He was uh, the ultimate performer. I love that where Heenan basically is kind of like ripping him apart and then perfect to snaps on him, which boom. I mean, once he snaps, he immediately turns baby face. I mean, he immediately right. gets the crowd behind him and then he replaces warrior who was originally supposed to be in the tag match. Then it becomes savage and headache at right. Survivor Series 92. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. I, I just uh, was definitely a, a big, perfect fan. I thought he was great. I kind of like him better as a heel, though, for, for the most part. But it was cool to see him as as the baby face there. They actually do lose that match by, uh, excuse me, win that match by disqualification. So good match there at Survivor Series. But they only win by DQ, which then sets up the further angle. Royal Rumble, him and Flair get into it. He eliminates him. Then they have the loser leaves town match where he beats Flair and sends Flair back to WCW as well. So it's not like he's the main event, but it's not like he's nowhere near the bottom of the card. I mean, he's upper mid card for sure. By sure. Lower top of the card, we'll say. It's interesting. So King of the Ring 93 happens, right? He has an awesome match 
um, after lo- losing lo- Lex Luger at WrestleMania, he has an awesome match at King of the Ring with Bret Hart. I mean, they, again, just tear the house down, have an awesome match. So when you look at Perfect, it's like, okay, what's he doing? He's feuding with Bret. Bret gets a win. He's going to end up feuding with Shawn Michaels. Michaels is kind of going to get the, the best of him in that feud. Do you like him being used in that role? Do you think in 1993 he's still in his prime, like he could still be a like main event or world champion level? Yeah, and when you're writing something and you're saying, who can wrestle Shawn Michaels, uh, Bret Hart, <clears throat> the first thing that pops in your head is perfect. You know you're going to have an incredible match. Yeah. And the thing is here, so he's kind of got the injury happening. Obviously, he's got the, the bad back, got the knee injury. I mean, things right. are happening. He's starting to slow down a bit on his career. He's like I said, losing to Michaels. He's going to guest referee at WrestleMania 10 for Luger and for Yoko. He's going to guest referee years later in a, in the world title match between Michaels and Bulldog. He's going to become an announcer. He is going to kind of become Triple H's manager for a little bit. Do you right. like him in this like non wrestling role? I mean, do do you think that absolutely, absolutely when he couldn't he couldn't wrestle? He had signed up uh, Lloyd's of London, right? That is another thing I was going to bring up. So, don't know how hurt. I know he de- definitely had injury, but how legit were the injuries, and how much did Lloyd's of London really kind of play into him not wrestling? Well, he couldn't wrestle, so I mean, I don't know how legit it was, but he had to pass some kind of physical from Lloyd's of London, so it showed up that he was injured. Man, it just seems like. They could have done more with Perfect towards the end, but obviously Lloyd's London and the injuries kind of caught up with him. Great to see him on TV. I just felt like, man, they, there was more potential there in WWF to do more with him. Maybe not world champion, but, man, he's one of those guys you list on your list of, like, one of the best wrestlers not to win the WWF world title. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you Kurt guys... Was one... What? Go ahead. You... Oh, so you're going to say Steve Kern was, was one? No, I, I, I was going to say... That Kurt was one of the greatest performers I ever saw. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When you guys get the chance to sign him, basically he's going to show up in 97. And, you know, he's not Mr. Perfect, obviously. They WWF owns the name. He's Kurt Henning, but everyone knows who it is. Who's, who's the one that signs him? Is that Bischoff? Is that you? I mean, who's pushing no, for Eric, Kurt? Eric. Eric. That was – he did all the signings. Do you think it's – too many top guys, though? Like, to, oh, now we're going to get Kurt. Then you guys are going to get Raven. Like, you think you guys are signing too many guys? No. Uh, talent rises to the top. It's competition. <clears throat> now, he debuts, and obviously the first big match, uh, Bash makes a surprise appearance, and he's one of the, the mystery guys. It's Bash at the Beach, and it's DDP and his mystery partner, which is Kurt Hennig, versus uh, Randy Savage and Scott Hall. Hennig, of course, ends up turning on him and, and costing him the match. And obviously, Hennig and DDP have a, a feud there, and it basically you know b- builds up from there. But do you think that he should have stayed a babyface, or do you like him immediately turning heel? Because obviously, you're the booker at this point. Yeah, I love him turning heel. That's what he was, his, most of his run in WWF was at the time. What was the like the ceiling for him? Like what? It, like what were you thinking for him at this point? Because he does beat DDP at Road Wild. And DDP was getting pretty over in '97. But what's the like the thought process in your head? Like where do you want to see him going? <laughs> With that ability and talent, we wanted him right at the top. Maybe not against Hogan, but we were running two or three towns a night. He could have main evented one of those shows. He's a lot bigger at this point. I mean, he's looking huge. It looks awesome. He looks in great shape. Do you think that uh, he might have been taking some enhancements uh, at this point? He, he was looking jacked. I think every, I think everybody was back then. So the NWOs, you know, kind of around the corner, maybe trying to recruit him. The Four Horsemen is really trying to recruit him, and he basically right. takes the spot of Arn Anderson on Nitro. He becomes a Four Horseman. Do you love he, – obviously, he says it would be a privilege, and when they make fun of him the week later, he says it would yeah. be an honor, which is just a funny funny line that they were saying. And and then 
Hennig ends up turning and joining the NWO and beating up the Horsemen. But do you like how that all went down? Because it's one of the greatest promos, really, with Arn Flair legitimately crying in the back. Hennig takes the spot. Then, boom, the week after, Nash makes fun of Arn. Then a few weeks later, a fall for all 97 in War Games, Hennig turns. You Booking-wise, do you love that? Because, man, you're building some heat there. there there's no doubt about that. Well, the, it, it, it was brilliant. It worked out perfectly. Got a lot of heat on the NWO. Do you think Hennig really could have been or should have been a horseman longer? Or no, that this was just a storyline device no. and you were using it for the turn? Exactly. exactly. When you look at, when you look at like Hennig here, he's going to be in the NWO, but it's almost like another huge name in the NWO. Like there's, you already got Hogan, you already got Hall, you already got Nash. Do you think it's almost too many big name yes. deals in the NWO? It should have been Hogan, Nash, Hall, and Six, and that's it. It's it's almost overkill at this point. I mean, it's it's awesome. I love the turn. I like everything, but it's almost too many guys. It's it's a, it definitely is a bit of overkill with with Hennig joining, but you know, it's it's just another huge name to to add to the to, to the roster. Another huge name getting the t shirt, if you will. Right, exactly. It should have been those four, the original. Turn and then adding six. It was perfect. So he wins the U.S. title after he t- turns on, on Flair and beats the hell out of him, and NWO wins that war games. He's going to become the man that made Minnesota famous. He wins the U.S. title, defeating Mongo, who's a fellow horseman, the next night. He held the belt for about three months, which also included a successful title run against Ric Flair at Halloween Havoc that year and a no DQ match at World War III he retained. He would eventually lose the U.S. title to DDP at Starcade. The Flair feud kind of stinks. JP, hold on for a second. I'm going to go to the restroom. Hold on. Okay. Okay. So you don't get to end the Flair feud because Flair has an injury, right? I mean, yeah. is that that basically what, what happened? Why Flair and him never had a blow-off to that feud? Right, right. Rick was hurt. Does that, booking-wise, does that just, like, kill it, though? Because that was going to be a, a monster feud for you guys, it seemed like, with, with Flair. We didn't know how long Rick was going to be out. And, you know, you're building it up because Hennig beats him at World War Three, yeah, and, and right. Havoc. you got to go a so different just, way. You got to go a different way if you don't know how long the guy's going to be out. Gotcha. On TV, now, it, six weeks is a long time. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, and when you when you look at it too, it's like okay, you did have so many other guys, obviously, for him to feud with. Anyway, Bret Hart comes in, so you know, you know, what I mean, Rick Rude comes in and joins Henning and joins NWO, but you got Bret Hart, who then had a key kind of. Feud with in the meantime right 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 and i thought the get other guys thing would, would have been the way to go yes would have been awesome definitely yeah. so yeah. he loses to bread it uncensored but he beats british bulldog at spring stampede but then he gets a knee injury then he gets hurt in 98 and it's one of those things where it just keeps happening right i mean he, he he's getting hurt a lot more as far as yeah. later on in his career right and that's because of the bumps he took earlier in his career. Do you think that you have to, as a booker, treat him differently because the injuries you got to, he's got to wrestle can't. less, he's got to work certain guys, or no, you can't do, you can't, you can't book like that. You can't. You got to get the most out of them as you can because you never know when the injury is going to occur again. So with him, it does end up kind of joining NWO Wolfpack back when you guys did the split, but then, of course, he turns on them, and he joins NWO Hollywood. Too many, too much NWO stuff, right? I mean, you guys are killing the Golden Goose here. Yeah. 
the NWO was no longer the force it was when we kept on acting guys. It was the beginning of the end. That's why I think the bloodline is so good. There's only four of them. Yep. You got to keep it small. Yeah, you got to keep yep. it. So basically, he would end up feuding with Goldberg for a little bit, too. Goldberg obviously beat him. Is that just a good name for Goldberg to kind of beat and put on the mantle? And obviously, they had yeah. the title match at Bash the Beach that year. But that's, that's got to be good for Goldberg, right? Nothing but a plus. He beats a good name, and he probably learns something, too. Yeah. I mean, he beat one of the greatest workers of all times. And then, too, eventually after that, then the horsemen are starting to get a little bit of revenge as Flair and and Malenko. And, you know, they're starting to basically reform the, the, the team here. And Flair comes back and has that awesome promo with Arn and JJ and all the guys. And they add Malenko to the group. Hennig ends up losing to Malenko. So, I mean, he is kind of putting a, a lot of guys over as well. Then another knee injury again for Hennig. Right. So he's got to take time off. So it's like he's really catching the injury bug big time in WCW. Right. Hey, JP, we need to wrap this up. I got an appointment to see a real estate agent. Sorry about this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's let's yeah. wrap this one up. Yeah. Uh, I've got to mention, I do, before we wrap this one up, we got to mention the West Texas Rednecks. Yeah. <laughs> WCW. Whose idea sure. was that? That was hilarious. That was great. I think it was Barry Windham's. Wow. I know yeah. he didn't really like it as much, Kurt, but then he got used to it, and then he then he made made it fun. You know, rap yeah. is crap, and the great the right. great country music. So he eventually made it fun and made it cool. But it's one of those things where you look back and you just chuckle because he's like, "Okay, I'm a horseman, then I'm an NWO, then I'm a West Texas redneck." Yeah, just like funny gimmick for sure. Yeah, but I wasn't big on Kurt being a funny guy. Didn't like the comedy aspect of it. No. He was a uh, Mr. Perfect. It was weird, but it was almost like, okay, thank God he's doing something and something different. And he made it work. Like he made it funny. Oh, it wasn't like it a main event he, thing, but he made it work. He, he could make anything work. Yep. Yeah. So basically, he's going to have a little bit more time in WCW. Does not really, you know, he feuds with Sean Stasiak and things. And he was a part of his powers at B angle, but nothing really major, nothing great came out of that after that. And obviously TNA and XWF, and he made a return to the WWE in, in 2002. Great uh, appearance at the Royal Rumble, but they didn't really do anything after that. It was almost like he was kind of fading and fading away and, and fading out of the business, even though he looked like he was in unbelievable shape. And he just, you know, and he's only 44. If you think about it now, so many guys are main, to main eventing at 44. I mean, The Rock is 50s wrestling. Jericho is 50 somethings wrestling. So when it, it comes to February 10th, 2003, he actually dies in Brandon, Florida, his hotel room. They find him. He's only 44 years old, only a few weeks away from his 45th birthday. So super young to die. He was of acute cocaine intoxication. Uh, that's the you know the cause of the death. Man, I mean, maybe steroids and painkillers, they said also could have contributed as well. So, man, what, what a sad way to go. And only 44 years old for Kurt Hennig. Yeah, horrible, horrible. horrible. So what's the, leg what's the legacy of Kurt? One of the greatest workers of all times. Totally agree. He, I would say he's nothing but perfect, if you will. Right, great. That's a great way. So Damn let's man. wrap this up. And and this one, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Kevin, what do you got going on in this crazy world? I'm actually giving a seminar tonight at CCW. I'm going up to Philly uh, the week after WrestleMania to do a signing, uh, and then I'm back here in Florida for CCW on the 12th and 13th. So. They're getting some steam with CCW, so it's very good. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody Thank you. out there for listening. See you right back here next week. Have a good one, folks.